When I was nine, I visited the Jewish Museum in Berlin for the first time. I was captivated by the stories, tales familiar enough they could have been my grandmother telling them over Shabbat dinner. I was excited to write my wishes for the future on a paper pomegranate and made sure to hang it from the highest branch of the indoor tree. When I got to the second floor, I thought I had taken a wrong turn. The clanging sounded like dishes being washed and stacked. I soon saw that the noise was coming from the shifting and resettling of hundreds of uneven iron plates on the floor of the next exhibit. I happily joined the visitors who were stepping on them. Struggling to keep my balance, I looked down. And that's when I noticed. Each plate had wide, gaping eyes and a mouth open in a scream. I've been visiting Germany every summer for as long as I can remember, and even lived in Berlin for a year on a beautiful street called Folgesang, or Birdsong Road. I loved hanging out at my Oma's house in the countryside next to the farm where my dad grew up, and I liked the freedom to roam about the city of Berlin with friends and no adults far sooner than my parents would have allowed back home in the United States. These adventures taught me many lessons, three of which I'd like to share today. Germany taught me about difference. In fourth grade, when my teacher, Frau Papa, lined us up for religion class, I stood alone. Public school religious education was as foreign to me as a Jewish classmate was to my German friends. As Catholics and Protestants filed toward the cafeteria and assembly hall, I made my way alone to the tiny classroom on the fourth floor. I felt a pang of public isolation as never before. Back home in Ann Arbor, I had always enjoyed explaining my Jewish traditions to my non-Jewish friends. But in Berlin, I only felt conspicuous. Even acts of concern seemed double-edged. Police protecting us with machine guns during Shabbat services, and well-meaning but incessant questions from my friends about the rules of keeping kosher and missing school were constant reminders of the special status I would have preferred to shed. My pride of difference was overshadowed by my by the discomfort of sticking out. I came away from these experiences more conscious than ever before of the isolation that others too must feel in a whole variety of situations that might seem comfortable to me. Germany also taught me about remembering. In German, there are two words for what we call a memorial, Denkmal and Mahnmal. Denkmal, which derives from the word for thinking and remembering, is a reminder of something good, worth celebrating or honoring. A monma, by contrast, is a reminder of something bad, something that should never be repeated, something we must overcome, or something for which we must repent. The Holocaust Memorial in Berlin is perhaps Germany's most famous example of a monma, but I'd like to focus here on a more subtle monma, one that I find even more powerful. Sprinkled throughout Berlin and across Europe cities are small brass plaques called Stolpersteine. These small plates are engraved with the names and the fates of the victims of the Nazis and are set into the sidewalks where the victims last lived. These unassuming stumbling stones attract the eye of pedestrians passing by. They vividly inject the victims' names into the most mundane routine of anyone glancing down at the unexpected shine. They are a memory of a specific victim and force onlookers to recall a single name and face remembering the victim as an individual tragedy, not just as part of a horrific statistic. They also serve as a daily warning about a neighborhood's specific past. They prevent citizens from forgetting. The Stolpersteine implicitly instruct us to recall and to address, address injustice, not just in great monuments and deeds, but in simple, everyday action. The iron plates I encountered that day at the Jewish Museum taught me yet a third lesson, and the final one I'd like to draw today. Menashe Kaddishman's fallen leaves can be as loud as a cafeteria or as quiet as a cemetery. I've returned to the exhibit several times over the past few years because it fascinates me. Sometimes visitors crouch on the plates, taking selfies and laughing at the difficulty of keeping their balance. Other times, groups stand still at the edge of the exhibit, silent in thought. I've noticed that visitors tend to follow the lead of the groups in front of them. If one group stands still in reverent silence, newcomers don't often tread onto the plates. But if one person walks on, others often follow. After all, no sign says stay off. 
Most remarkable, this doesn't seem to work the other way around. No one ever leads others to stop walking on the faces. No one ever seems to make that fuss. I found this to be a powerful message that can guide us looking forward as well. We like to follow others. We look to each other to see what is socially acceptable or cool. This is so for kids, but seems true for adults as well. We feel more comfortable when we fit in and often feel reluctant to step away from something that everyone else is doing. Cottersman's exhibit reminds us to think twice about following the pack. Sometimes following is important, but more often we must act on our own decisions, even if it means making a fuss. Back home, these German lessons have continued to guide me. My German lessons have made me more attuned to isolation. I see and hear things every day that unnecessarily alienate others. Swastikas painted on a prominent wall in town or public professions of allegiance to the Confederate flag both point out difference in ways that say you don't belong. But even offhand comments like orchestra gives me depression or people should chill out about their pronouns are damaging and hurtful when we mock mental illness by using it as a joke or disrespect and ignore a person's identity, we widen gaps, promote isolation, and prevent understanding. My German lessons have also made me see how we still fail to confront our own history. We all too often avoid topics of slavery and lynching and the persistence of symbols of racism and hatred. We do not have large monuments to the millions of lives lost to American slavery, and we do not yet mark every place where lynching victims lived or lynchings occurred, and we do not adequately address the persecution and destruction of Native American cultures. Some, like Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, are drawing on the German experience. Building on the Stolpersteine, the Community Remembrance Project seeks to recognize individual victims of lynchings by erecting historical markers and collecting soil for individual lynching sites. Like the simple plaques in Berlin, these markers attempt to acknowledge and address a large issue in the context of the individual lives that were and are still affected by injustice and hatred. These conversations about our history also demand grappling with buildings and institutions named for individuals. We celebrate some of their deeds, but often ignore the isolation and destruction they created along the way. In some cases, we might simply choose a new name for these buildings to commemorate a positive part of our past rather than a damaging one. In other situations, however, we might consider preserving some small reminder of our more difficult past in the form of a warning or a mon mod. We should celebrate the history we are proud of, but we should not hide from the events we regret. Returning to Kaddishman's exhibit once more, my German lessons have also taught me not to be a bystander. We must all strive to be those people who do not walk on the faces. We must stand up and tell others to stop. We must not be complicit. When our role models, whether parents, teachers, or friends, say or do things that alienate others, we must show them the difference they disrespect. We must teach about difference, notice isolation, and stand up rather than standing by when there is a fuss to be made. In making this fuss, we recall times that we ourselves have felt isolated. We remember that those who suffer have names, stories, and needs. And we make this bus with the hopes of teaching others to respect difference, to notice isolation, and to take their own action, however big or small that may be.